today, everywhere in Africa, everywhere in the world, the West is bombing democracy into our people and destroying what used to be paradise. They come with sanctions and injunctions. You do this or we sanction you. You do this or we bomb you and so on. That has been the relationship. That relationship must change. Because you go to the United States of America and you have the Democrats and you have the Republicans. Tell me what is the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. All of them will bomb Iraq. All of them will send troops to Afghanistan. All of them will build institutions that discriminate against black people, that discriminate against Chicanos, that discriminates against Indians and so on. The West insists that if you want to deal with them, you need to have a certain kind of government. They even go to the extent of determining who should be our leaders even today. Again, it's important to recognize that China is not holding guns to our heads and telling us that if you need assistance from me, you have to have this kind of government or that kind of government. This is not new colonialism. This is partnership in development. And this is different. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This show always tries to show you the different voices from China and the whole global south. Especially the voices and stories are often being neglected by the Western mainstream media. I'm very honored that joining me today is this gentleman. His name is Quisi Pratt, and he's from Ghana, and he's also the founder of Pan-Africa Television. So welcome to China, Mr. Fred. Thank you, thank you very much. And you know what? You gave a, an amazing speech at the forum for the whole Global South. And I always try to understand different perspectives, different cultures by traveling to different countries and also talking to the local people from different countries, different continents. And sometimes when I, try, when I talk to people from different African countries, it's shocking to me that, for example, most people know coffee beans from different African countries, but you cannot find the best coffee beans, best coffees when you actually go to Kenya because all the beans being taken to other countries. Africa has cocoa beans, but you cannot find the best chocolate in Africa. And I remember a speech by one of the amazing women from Africa. She said, when she was giving this speech to a bunch of European audiences, she said, it's unfair. How can you take all the gold from our continents, but your currency way uh, worth way much more than our currencies? You take the gold from us. And you mentioned that in your speech as well how Africa, the whole continent, is still being exploited by this so-called New World Order. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about that? I'm sure most people are still so ignorant about the whole African continent that they don't even realize. Well, that's the paradox of Africa. I mean, Africa is by far the richest continent on Earth. Africa practically has everything. Intelligent human beings, strong human beings. We have many, many rivers, rivers crisscrossing the continent. We have diamond, we have gold, we have bauxite, we have oil, we have gas, we have uranium, lithium, everything. Dense forests. We are surrounded by the sea and, and so on. And Africa is such a beautiful place. And yet the African people, are so very poor. Our poverty and underdevelopment, in part, can be explained by our history. We were enslaved. We went through the transatlantic slave trade, where our people were captured as beasts of burden and made to work for hundreds of years without pay. And the people who were captured by these European adventurists were largely the best on our continent. The young ones, the architects, the doctors, the engineers, and so on. These were the people from our continent who were captured in their millions to work the fields in North America, to work the fields in the Caribbean, to work the fields in Europe, 
in order to create the basis for the development of Western capitalism. So this is the paradox. Now, we also went into a period of classical colonialism. And under classical colonialism, we were even denied the right to choose our own leaders. The head of state of Ghana, for example, was the Queen of England. The Queen of England appointed all public officials, and we had no say in that. Now, we waged a relentless and courageous struggle against colonialism, and we won the battle against colonialism with the help of our friends. And our friends included China. Our friends included the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and so on. And eventually, we won the battle against classical colonialism. But we are still not free, because we have entered a new era of neocolonialism, where colonialism has managed to wear disguises. It is disguised. But our resources are still exploited and owned. First of all, they are owned by the giant multinational corporations of the West, from the colonial metropolis, and they are exploited, not for the benefit of our people, but they exploited in order to enlarge the, the, the bank accounts of the multinational corporations. And this is the African paradox. I post many interviews with uh, people from different countries, from Africa, from uh, Latin America. So when people talk about this, what you just said, they will say, especially the viewers from Europe or America, the Western audiences, they say, stop blaming others. It, it's your own fault. You have a not working uh, government, you corrupted leaders. That what caused you to so stop blaming something that happened hundreds of years ago. ago. And uh, they don't think the current international rule-based order is bringing some, are still oppressing people, especially uh, people from the global south, the developing nations. So can you explain that? Well, to start with, we are not blaming others. We are fighting for our freedom. And fighting for our freedom is not blaming others. We are in chains. We want to break those chains so that we can liberate ourselves, so that we can go out there and realize our full potential like all human beings. We are not making demands which are unreasonable. We demand that we are able to govern ourselves. That's a demand that all reasonable human beings anywhere in the world, whether they are Africans, Europeans, Chinese, or whatever, is a legitimate demand. We demand that what is embedded in our soil should belong to us. And we demand that what is embedded in our soils should be exploited and used in order to provide better housing for our people, in order to provide better health care for our people, in order to provide relevant education for our people, and so on. These are legitimate demands of all people anywhere in the world. So we are simply not blaming others. Our reality is that we have become the beast of burden for capitalism. And that's a reality we can't run away from. Look, we produce a lot of gold. And until recently when the dollar became a worthless paper, hmm, gold was the main mineral which backed the currency. And yet our currencies are fluctuating. Our currencies have become worthless as compared to the dollar and so on, in relation to the dollar and so on. How do we explain that situation? How do we explain the situation in which we have 1.2 billion people living on a continent with all of these resources, and yet we have to go out cap in hand begging for arms. How do we explain that situation? We have a legitimate right to complain. We have a legitimate right to struggle. We have a legitimate right to point out who are responsible for our underdevelopment. We are not blaming others. We know that we have to take our destiny into our own hands. We know that Africa would only develop if it unites its people and if it focuses attention on the pursuit of its interests determined by the African people. That's not blaming others. That's standing up for what is rightly ours. You know, China-Africa relations has been talked a lot, um, especially on Western mainstream media. I think I hear two uh, different narratives that are very negative about this relationship. One is by typical, typical Westerners. They say China is just, it's just uh, buying up Africa, coercing African countries to follow China's orders. Uh, this is from the West. But also I hear 
the narrative from certain people in Africa as well. They say, although they don't like Western democracy, Western style, they also don't like China's style. They say China will be an, the next Western imperial powers that one day they will conquer whole Africa as well. So I'm wondering, what's your thought on this uh, China, China, Africa relations, and uh, what's the difference between China's relations with Africa and the West relation with Africa? Every Chinese leader that I've known, that I've listened to and read, has emphasized the point that China is building its society based on the aspirations of its own people. And every Chinese leader that I've listened to and read, from Chairman Mao to President Xi, they have said that the Chinese model is not a model which should be copied. So China is not imposing its model on us. Of course, China is doing things which can provide inspiration for us. China is doing things which can show us that there's another way and so on. But China has never insisted that any country, any people, should copy its model. It's also important to make the point that throughout our history, China has never dropped bombs on us. All the bombs that have been dropped on us, all the guns which have been pointed at us, which have killed our people, are guns from the West. The bombs have come from the West. They have not come from China. Indeed, throughout our history, our people have never been slaves to China. China never enslaved us. China didn't colonize us. China always stood on our side as a friend. We struggled against apartheid, and apartheid is the worst form of racism. Who were the people who supported the apartheid regime? Which institutions supported the apartheid regime? It was the Western institutions. Non-governmental organizations from the West, the Western military establishment, the Western intelligence services and so on, supported apartheid. We were supported by China. So China throughout history has been a friend. A friend that does not impose his will on our people. There is talk of, of the possibility of China assuming the role that the Western powers have assumed. That possibility does not exist. Listen, until recently, if you wanted to make a telephone call from Ghana to Togo, you had to route that call through Paris or London. Even now, if you have to travel to some African countries from an African country, you have to route your flight through Europe. China is helping us to build that critical infrastructure which makes us independent and which promotes trade among the African people and which facilitates exchanges amongst the African people. So the project that the China is, is, is embarking upon in Africa are railway lines. Railway lines linking one African capital to the other. That is in our interest. Indeed, I like to look at the railway lines in my own country. And I look at the railway lines in my own country and they tell a story. What is the story do these railway lines tell? They always, always start from areas of concentration of wealth and end up in the ports. So there's a railway line from the area which has bauxite, it ends up in the port. Railway lines from areas where we have timber, it ends up in the port. Railway lines from the gold mines, they end up in the port. This is symptomatic of the colonial economy, of the neo-colonial economy. So we did not build infrastructure in order to facilitate exchanges between our people. We did not build infrastructure in order to ensure that we are taking raw materials to areas of production and so on. This is what we want to reverse. And this is what Chinese technology and Chinese finance is helping us to achieve. This is not neocolonialism. This is partnership in development. And this is different. Again, it's important to recognize that China is not holding guns to our heads and telling us that if you need assistance from me, you have to have this kind of government or that kind of government. The West insists that if you want to deal with them, you need to have a certain kind of government. They even go to the extent of determining who should be our leaders even today. On February 24, 1966, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States of America overthrew the Nkrumah government. They actually organized the overthrow of the most prominent leader of the African people. They killed Patrice Lumumba 
French, Belgium, and other Western intelligence services came together, and they killed Patrice Lumumba. They dissolved his body in acid and took out his front teeth as souvenir. This barbarism has never been exhibited by China. Today, everywhere in Africa, everywhere in the world, the West is bombing democracy into our people and destroying what used to be paradise. They bombed Libya. They destroyed Libya. They killed Gaddafi. And today there is total chaos in Libya. You understand? So this is the difference between the Western approach to developing relationships with us and the Chinese approach to developing relationships with us. They come with sanctions and injunctions. You do this or we sanction you. You do this or we bomb you, and so on. That has been the relationship. That relationship must change, and we will definitely ensure that that relationship changes. Because that relationship is not in our interest, and that relationship cannot contribute to the building of a new world without a bomb. To the building of a new world in which we all see ourselves as equal partners in the preservation of life. We will change that relationship. I think it's important for us to make a distinction between form and essence. We are told that if a country is governed by one party, it's a dictatorship. And that if a country has more political parties, then it's a democracy. But that's a very simplistic way of looking at things. That way only looks at form and not essence. Because you go to the United States of America, and you have the Democrats and you have the Republicans. Tell me what is the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. All of them will bomb Iraq. All of them will send troops to Afghanistan. All of them will build institutions that discriminate against black people, that discriminate against Chicanos, that discriminate against Indians, and so on. So the fact that you have two parties does not mean that you have options. Two parties does not necessarily mean that they are different. They are two sides of the same coin. So this whole fixation with multi-partyism and single-partyism and so on is, is an attempt to look at form you know, rather than to look at essence. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important that we get away from that. Now, no matter what you say, about the Chinese system of government, whether you like it or not, that is not the issue. The issue is, over the last couple of years, China has managed to bring millions of people out of poverty. Over the last couple of years, life expectancy has improved in China. Over the last couple of years, China has become, some say, the second largest economy in the world. But those who say that China has become the second largest economy in the world are looking at the gross domestic product. There are other indicators which point to the fact that China today is the largest economy in the world. But that is significant because 40 years ago, 50 years ago, China was an agrarian economy with a per capita income of a developing country. What is it that has made it possible for China within a period of 40 years, to transform itself into a super industrial country with the largest economy in the world? These are questions that we need to ask. And the answers to these questions may inspire us to do something other than what we are doing today. Now, there's a question of African unity. And I think that is imperative. Pan-Africanism is an imperative in Africa. Why is it an imperative in Africa? Hmm? But Africanism is an imperative in Africa because today the geographical areas we describe as countries hmm, were not created by us. It was Otto von Bismarck who actually invited European powers to Bonn to divide Africa into the spheres of their influence. So these European leaders took a map on a, put a map on the table. There was no African around. It was only European leaders. They took pencils and began to draw lines across Africa. These are the lines today which have become our national boundaries. And I travel through Africa a lot. 
You understand? You go to the border between Ghana and Togo, and you find one house. The bedroom is in Ghana, the kitchen is in Togo. The people in that house, who are they? You go to the border with La Côte d'Ivoire, and you find part of the Nzema people in La Côte d'Ivoire, and part of them in Ghana. You understand? So these borders were so arbitrarily carved, and they have led to the creation, in most part, of small, small states which are non-viable and which are open to exploitation. Our quest for African unity is to overcome this heritage of colonialism and exploitation. Our quest for African unity is to enable us to pull our resources together, to act together, to become strong, as Nkrumah and others advocated. Nkrumah and others wanted a united Africa with a common defense policy common foreign policy, common economic policy, and so on. That is the salvation for Africa. We must definitely achieve the unity of the African people because that is the only way forward for the African people. As always, you give like very touching, motivating speech and that really just expose some of the hypocrisy and uh, ignorance of many people, especially in the West. But I'm sure there are a lot of people in China also ignorant, but it's the journey that we all have to, that's our mission, to educate people. Our mission is to throw light where there is darkness. Our mission is to sow the seeds of love to replace hatred. Our mission is to create a better world in which nobody goes hungry. Our mission is to create a world without a bomb, a world in which its people protect the environment, a new world in which we cooperate for our own advancement. That's the vision. Thank you so much. Thank you.